What's good everyone, OJ here, welcome back to another video. Today we've got some interesting topics to go over, but before we get into that, please make sure you hit that like button, subscribe if you're someone new, click that notification bell, and make sure to drop a comment on any of the topics that we're going to talk about in the comment section below. Now with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump right into this, and we're starting off with, did Atlas make a big mistake on a big upcoming RPG sequel? It might seem that way based on some new information coming out from the COMG pre-orders. Now, this is not absolute or the be-all end-all when it comes to Soul Hackers 2 and how it could potentially do sales-wise overall because the COMG charts only cover Japan and it's the pre-orders for right now. But what Mr. Pierre 485, who does a lot of data and collecting and sales, he actually put together a comparison chart with Shin Megami Tensei 5 on the Nintendo Switch compared to Soul Hackers 2 on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 when it comes to pre-orders and compared the sales so far. And it does seem like they made a huge mistake on the platform that this is going to be on based off of this right here now once again this is just japan and it's just the pre-orders and there's still more time and guys i'll be the first person to tell you i am going to be rushing out and buying soul hackers 2 day one when it launches this summer it's launching in just a few months here right so i'm going to be buying it day one on the playstation 5 so i have no issue at all what I'm doing is actually looking at the data here and comparing and maybe saying, wait a minute, there's a problem here, especially if Shin Megami Tensei 5, which is on one system, compared to obviously the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5, although the Switch does have a bigger install base, so we do have to factor that in as well, but I wanted to go over the information. Now, you guys are seeing the chart here. You see the COMG pre-order comparison, Soul Hackers 2 versus SMT5. You have days left. SMT5 on the Nintendo Switch, Soul Hackers 2, PS4, PS5, and then the difference. So you look at the days left, 100 days, all the way down to 89. It's counting it down, and it's counting exactly where Shin Megami Tensei 5 is. You're looking at that. 76, 75, 73, 70, getting new pre-orders in the pretty good amounts as we get closer and closer to the launch of the game. So that's definitely a good thing, and you're seeing it right there not bad smt5 i think i did over 100k in japan at launch however if you look at soul hackers 2 on the ps4 and the ps5 you're seeing 9 9 12 12 13 10 10 11 this is a massive difference in pre-orders and hype beforehand with the same amount of time now aligned up okay now there's a couple things to factor in here right there's a huge difference we're seeing 47 48 44, 50, 60, there's huge differences in the amount and the rate of pre-orders. Now, once again, we have to factor in a couple different things here. It is still a while before launch. It's hard to get PS5s. PS4 is fading when it comes to the popularity over there. Also, Shin Megami Tensei is more popular than Soul Hackers. Now, if this was Persona 6, obviously it'd be a completely different situation i'm pretty sure that the pre-orders would be way higher even if it was just ps4 and ps5 in japan or anything so that would be different however the stark difference between these two games because these are less popular right than the personas out there that sega slash atlas has so a comparison was made and maybe because the last soul hackers game that people got was on the nintendo 3ds that was the last one on a Nintendo platform, and now you're putting it on a non-Nintendo platform, so maybe that could have affected the pre-orders or the sales. And on top of that, the shifting, I would just say, landscape of Japan, since we had Persona, since we had some of those games that came out before with Atlas, where the Nintendo Switch was not a dominant platform, but now at this point in Japan, the Switch absolutely dominates the sales charts so if you want to have some success in japan with your rpg obviously launching on the switch would be a good idea if that's going to be a market for you now once again this is just japan and i'm buying soul hackers to day one but it definitely doesn't look good for day one sales now things could turn around they could get some new promotions going they could have some stuff that comes up to where the pre-orders kind of ramp up as we get into the summer and everything and of course, once again, this is not the US. I'm pretty sure sales will be okay here. 
but this definitely doesn't look good right now. So that begs the question, did Atlas mess up? Did they make a mistake on the platforms that this game is on? And I would say maybe. I do think that potentially making this game not on the Switch at launch could be a mistake if the sales come out and things aren't so good there and things just aren't so good for a revival of a series that's been dead for quite some time now. It's Soul Hackers 2. It's not Soul Hackers 5, 6, or 7 or something like that. There hasn't been a ton of these. And you also have to remember, for those who don't know, Shin Megami Tensei 5 is the best-selling Shin Megami Tensei game of all time on the Nintendo Switch by itself. It's over a million units, and they announced that like a month or two ago. So it sold over a million in less than half a year or about half a year's time, which was really impressive for Shin Megami Tensei 5. So I'm hoping, and I'm also thinking that the US support for this game is going to be much better, but I can't help but think that they probably made a mistake on this one but that's not my thing to worry about. Obviously, it'd be great to have it on the Switch, but I'm buying it day one on PlayStation 5. I think it's gonna be a fantastic game based on what I'm seeing here, but there could be a mistake being made here because this is a very big difference in pre-orders here from something to where I would expect to be a little bit closer when it comes to it, considering Soul Hackers hasn't been around for a long time and this is what people wanted. People wanted Soul Hackers, right? So based on those surveys and all that. So what do you guys think about this discrepancy between Shin Megami Tensei 5 and Soul Hackers so far with the Japanese pre-order numbers? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. All right, now moving on to the next topic here, guys. We've got a brand new interesting RPG called Wuthering Waves. Now, this is a brand new open world action RPG from Punishing Grey Raven Studio Kudo Game. And the interesting thing about this is that I can't help but think Genshin Impact when I look at this game. I never even really knew about it. Uh, the information about this game just came out recently, so I did want to go over it because it does look pretty cool from what they've shown so far, and it's not much here, guys. So let's go over this. Punishing Grey Raven developer Kudo Game has released the debut gameplay trailer for Wuthering Waves. It's a new open world action RPG currently in development. Now, the gameplay trailer followed a cinematic trailer released on May 25th and a teaser trailer released prior to that. Now, in the video description for the gameplay trailer, Kudo Game noted that the game is still in the early stages of development, so graphic qualities might not be ideal. Now, platforms and a release window for Wuthering Waves, and I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> have not yet been announced. Now, you can check out the official website, link in the description. You can follow the game on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, Discord, Tap Tap, Billy Billy. Is it Billy Billy? <laughs> and is it Weibo? I don't know how to say that correctly. But anyway, all the information on keeping up with this game, if you want to follow the development, is in the link in the description. Gamatsu has the beat on that one. And from what I'm seeing so far with the CG trailer and the premiere teaser trailer, and more importantly, the gameplay trailer, it looks like it's a pretty, you know, fast, fluid type of game like Genshin Impact. The combat reminds me of it a lot. The graphics remind me of it a lot. And it kind of reminds me too of like Devil May Cry, that style of game, but it looks like super action, Bayonetta, all of that. So it's right up my alley, but I'm wondering exactly how the development of this game or the progression is going to be. Is it going to be one of those like games as a service type of RPGs where you're constantly having to get new characters and buy them through that type of thing or get different packs and use energy and all of that? Because in the gameplay trailer, it shows a variety of different characters. So I think that's something that we're going to have to wait and see and probably is if you check out some of the stuff there. But either way, like I said, I'm always interested in new open world action RPGs. I'm a big fan. I mean, I do like the general concept of Genshin, and I do like these style of games, and this does look good. And based off of what they've shown early in development, it looks pretty good for early in development. I see a lot of people that are judging it and saying, oh my gosh, this is all messed up and stuff, but it's early. And so far, so good from what I'm seeing here, but we're going to have to wait and see exactly how this turns out. But what are your thoughts on this, guys, when it comes to this new game, Wuthering Waves? Are you planning on following the development? Looking forward to exactly when this game is going to be released. It's early, so it's probably going to be a number of years from now, but we can look forward to it. So what are your thoughts? Please let me know in the comment section below. 
All right, and moving on to the next topic here, guys. We have to discuss this because this is something that I think was right there in plain sight. Not even I think. I know it was in plain sight, and I think I covered it before with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and this major aspect about the game, but I wanted to go just a little bit more in depth with it because this is something that was brought to my attention recently on a live stream, and it's the second time in the Xenoblade franchise that we actually have this thing, and the first time since 2015 Xenoblade Chronicles X, and that is Xenoblade Chronicles 3 having a real open world. Now, this name of open world or this thing, gameplay mechanic, is thrown around a lot in games, but sometimes they're not always real open worlds. Heck, I've been kind of schmixed myself with Pokemon Legends Arceus at first when they show off the game, but then you start running into the loading screens, you start running into different things, and I think that a lot of developers are very careful with their wording in these days, and Nintendo in particular is very careful because they never called Pokemon Legends Arceus an open world game other people were doing that based on how it looked and then it turned out to not be that now with the new pokemon game they're calling that open world they're making sure to call it hey it's an open world game and now with xenoblade chronicles 3 you can clearly see in the eShop description and on the nintendo.com description which i probably just glossed over but i want to talk about it it says join noah and mio members of the two opposing nations of keeves and angus on a heartfelt journey through a rich open world to end the cycle of violence through a rich open world so this will be out of all the xenoblade chronicles games out there if you count all of like the dlcs as well future connected and also if you count the torn of the golden country right so out of everything this is only the second real open world xenoblade chronicles game which i think that yes you could see that in the trailer i mean there was various aspects that i felt was open world but people were asking me on my live streams is this open world is this open world i think i saw another video or so in my suggested that said this is an open world question mark or this is going to be an open world game so now we know for sure 100 percent like we can just put that information out there because yes they put that on there and maybe it's been here for a while but it's something that people haven't been talking about because we all thought or at least not we all but there was definitely discussion about xenoblade chronicles 2 oh that's an open world game as well and no, not quite so much. And same thing with Xenoblade Chronicles 1 on the Wii, then also the Definitive Edition. Oh, that's an open world game. Kind of, but not really. There's some loading screens and stuff. It does a good job of trying to emulate that. It's very close, but Xenoblade Chronicles X was the first true open world game in the Xenoblade franchise. Now, some people still feel, hey, look, it's close enough to be open world, and I get that. But I guess on a technicality, if you're looking at it, this is seamless. You can go anywhere that you want. There's not going to be a loading screen unless you do like a fast travel or something like that. But you can go from one point to another point on the map and there's no problem whatsoever you are just going through and it's just this huge and they said rich open world and from what we've seen so far with the gameplay clips it looks like a very rich and nice open world so i'm very happy to see that and i'm happy to see what they do to fill in those parts of the open world and for traversal i mean we did see like the boat in the first trailer so there are going to be ways you can swim really fast you know and everything like that so there might be some more ways to get around there might be some other things that they do in order for you to get around the locations because it is going to be a big and rich open world so xenoblade chronicles x it was fun because you had different types of mechs you know you had ones that can fly you had ones that can also transform and be kind of like roadsters and everything it was pretty cool to go through those open worlds and it was filled full of different type of wildlife and plants and mountains and from what we're seeing so far here this looks to be the same way but just like with a different style with the xenoblade chronicles 3 its own unique style so i'm very excited obviously this is great news to hear about this uh, that it's not going to be segmented in any type of way and i'm looking forward to exploring through this world so much xeno 3 is getting so close to release so what are your thoughts guys on this here when it comes to xenoblade chronicles 3 having a true open world gameplay let me know your thoughts in the comments section below all right and moving on to the final topic here guys star wars knights of the old republic 2 the sith lords gets a surprise announcement on the nintendo switch and it's coming sooner 
than you might think. So Asper will release Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords for the Nintendo Switch via the Nintendo eShop on June 8th for the low price of $14.99. The publisher announced pre-orders are now available as well. Here's a little bit of an overview of the game. So in this standalone sequel to the award-winning RPG Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, the Sith Lords have hunted the Jedi to the edge of extinction and are on the verge of crushing the Old Republic. With the Jedi Order in ruin, the Republic's only hope is a lone Jedi in exile struggling to reconnect with the Force. Lead a diverse crew of unique allies, make difficult choices with far-reaching consequences, and decide your destiny. Will you follow the light side and save the galaxy, or succumb to the dark side and bring it all down? Here are the key features of the game, a standalone sequel experience to follow up to the acclaimed original RPG Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic in this epic story set in the darkest days of the Old Republic. Choose your destiny, discover your past and make difficult choices that aren't as clear cut as good or evil. Each decision can have a significant impact on your story and your squad. Will you uphold the Jedi Order or lead the galaxy to ruin? Master the Force. Choose from three different classes of Jedi, each with access to a specific force power, and customize your characters with unique skills and abilities. And last but definitely not least, lead your crew. Command a party of diverse crewmates, each with their own strengths, alignments, and nuanced backstories. Your actions will influence your crew's destinies, but not everyone may agree with the choices you make. So you guys are checking out the trailer here. And the original Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, that did really well on the Switch when it launched. I think the low price with also the high review scores and praise that people had back when the game came out actually made it a top eShop seller for quite some time when it launched and even a bit after that. And they probably made a great amount of profit, so they decided to put over this one as well since the first one went well. So what do you guys think about Star Wars Knights of the Little Republic 2 coming over? Also, Xenoblade Chronicles, Wuthering Waves, and also if Atlas made that huge mistake with Soul Hackers 2, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this video here. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. Please make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe if you're someone new. Click that notification bell, and we will see you for the next video. Peace.